poll number one, and we're going to launch a poll. What time is it where you're at? Poll number one. Let's see what people put down for what time it is. Early. Most people, it's early. Okay. Uh, not lunchtime. We're 14 seconds in, 15 seconds in. So far, late morning is the number one answer. Uh, early morning, number two answer. And that late, late, some people come in late, late, late. One person came in late to see Dr. Funk so far. <laughs> 22 of you come in late, late, late at night. Okay, great. I'm going to end the poll and share the results with everyone so you can see what time everyone's coming in at. Late morning for most of you. And hopefully you got breakfast. Okay. Um, so let's go to poll number two. If we can find, if I can find that, and I'm going to launch the poll. There you go. We can see what people vote for number two. And uh, the poll is, have you ever been to Canada? Have you ever been to Canada? Okay. And so far, only one person says they're never going to go because it's an awful place. <laughs> they're never going to go because they live in Antarctica. Okay, the number one answer is many times. Number two answer is no, but I want to go. We're going to end the polling. We're going to share the results. So you can all see those results. And we're going to do a um, stop share in the results. And we'll go to poll number three. And poll number three is, have you been to Bloomington, Indiana or IU campus? Many times, some of you say, many times, no. Let me see, say no, one person, no, and I prefer it that way. Indiana is way too boring. I agree with you. Two people, yeah. it's way too boring of a place. Canada's amazing, Indiana, not so much, they say. <laughs> not boring, Dawn says. Okay, we're not boring. Hi, Bay Man. Good evening to you as well. This is still a little bit of the pre-show. This is still pre-showing. We're going to end the poll here in a second, but we got almost, we got more people who want to come to Bloomington. Look at that. Uh, they want, uh, they've been to the USA, not been to Indiana. Okay. Let's end the polling. Let's share the results with everybody. They're going to take a look at those results and uh, smile for where you're at. People want to show up. They want to come to the show. Okay, let's try the next and final poll before we start the, sh the real show. And we're going to launch this one. Have you ever seen Dr. Bunk speak before? Ah, we have a Hoosier in Ramsey. Thank you for coming, Ramsey. Uh, I hope Oscar's here as well. Okay, good, Titiana. Good to have you here. Um, Lots of folks. We are up to 235 people, 650 enrolled. Okay. <laughs> the number one answer is no, they haven't seen me, but they're here now. <laughs> uh, 37 of you, yes, more than once. And one person, I like the one honest person who says I'm rather boring. Okay, let's. Let's share the results on that one too. There you go. Okay. So that's the last poll till we get to some more stuff uh, till later on. So I'll stop sharing the results and stop the polls for now. Sarah, do you want to take it away there from O Canada? I will. Thank you, Dr. Bonk. All right, so we're officially at 1018. So good morning and welcome everybody to the webinar titled How to Motivate and Retain Online Learners. My name is Sarah Govro. I'm a research associate at Contact North and I will be moderating the session today. We have opened the chat to encourage dialogue among the participants, but if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A tool. 
We have a large group today, as Dr. Bonk mentioned. So we have current doctoral advisee of Dr. Bonk's, the marvelous Merve Bastogan with us, as well as former advisee, the fabulous Dr. Mena Zhu of Wayne State University. They will be helping us with the Q&A. Merve and Mena and I will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. And Dr. Bonk will stay for about 30 or 40 minutes after the presentation to answer some of the rest of the questions, tell jokes, and maybe he'll perform a few magic tricks. <laughs> as you are aware, the speaker today is Curtis Bonk, Professor of Instructional Systems Technology at Indiana University. He is trained in educational psychology and accounting at the University of Wisconsin. Kurt has assured me that he is no longer a boring accountant. As proof, Kurt played at the beginning some Beethoven music. So those who were there, those of you who are there early with us today got to listen to that since he was born on Beethoven's birthday, December 16th. Today, Dr. Bonk will speak on motivating and retaining online learners. He has a free book, adding some tech variety, 100 plus activities for motivating and retaining learners online that you can download in English and Chinese. I will put the uh, link in the chat here so you can have access to that. There we go. Uh, Kurt is a big fan of Canada and has many connections here. From east to west, he has visited St. John's, Newfoundland, Montreal, Niagara Falls, Toronto, Hamilton, London, Thunder Bay, Saskatoon, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, and Victoria. He even speaks some Canadian. You can test him during the Q&A. In the fall of 1998, he spent part of his sabbatical at Simon Fraser University out in Burnaby, British Columbia, which is a Vancouver suburb where he originally learned to speak Canadian. And coincidentally, he met Contact North Research Associate, Dr. Ron Austin, a former Dean of York University in Toronto. Dr. Austin will be delivering a very popular webinar on how to teach effectively with Zoom on July 8th. If you're interested, you can register at teachonline.ca under the webinar series. And I'll put that URL in the chat as well. We also have a lineup of a number of upcoming free webinars, so check that out as well. All right, that's it from me. Over to you, Dr. Bonk. Thank you, Sarah. It's amazing how many people signed up in just a couple of weeks' time. This was a late edition in June, and we weren't sure if we should make this in July or in June, but it filled up so much, so we expanded another 100. We expanded another 100. We expanded another 100. We're now at 280. What you forgot to mention is, is I went to White, uh, University of Wisconsin, but my real mentor is Yoda. So uh, just so I do have a Star Wars model that I'll be talking about in a little bit. And I'm going to give you a two for this can be a two for talk. You're not going to just hear about my tech variety model. You'll hear about my R2D2 Star Wars model as well. So we'll get in both in this session. If you have a piece of paper in front of you or you can grab one, you might want to divide it up into squares like this and make 10 rows and three columns. And at number it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We'll go through 10 principles of motivation. And I want you to fill in what ideas you really like, what you might be able to use, and what you can't use. If you can fill in a sheet of paper, and we'll come to the chat at the end and talk about the things you like or don't like or can use and might use. Yeah, basically, you don't have to have one, but if you want to write some ideas down, that's great. And I will stay at least a half hour, maybe 40 or 45 minutes to answer questions. Those of you in New Zealand, you'll want to go to bed. Fiji, you're already in bed. Uh, but thank you for those of you coming late, late, late at night. Hawaii, I apologize. Sorry, people in Hawaii, but you can watch the rerun. Anyways, maybe we should get started. Again, thank you to Mena, my former TA, my former advisee at Wayne State University, and Merve, my current one, who are both working on research with me. Uh, thanks for them to help out. And uh, we'll hear some of their ideas, actually. They're embedded in the talk. Things they taught me are in this talk. So we'll, and we'll also have Tom Reeves in the audience. He's taught me a few things. I see many of my friends here 
uh, who have taught me some things. So let's get back to those slides that we had up here at some point and, uh, and see if we can retain learners online. So I'm not sure if we'll be able to retain learners online, but maybe so. Let's see how we do here. So we've gone through the slides. We're back at slide number one, revisited. So the Tech Variety book you've seen, that's right here. Download it. Take a look at the tables at chapter one, chapter 15, chapter 14, how to train resistant instructors. Very important. Um, but if you don't like this book, get rid of it. We'll also talk about a little bit about the book that costs money. So people in the Philippines who are here, I, I, I appreciate you, you being and showing up here today because in the Philippines, I decided to make this book free because my publisher, Josie Bass, was charging too much money for this book and they didn't send too many books to the conference. They charged so much money, I bought the books and gave them away and I said, my next book will be free. It's in English, Chinese, soon Spanish and Uzbek, we hope, maybe Arabic and so forth. So um, both have 100 ideas in them and I'll be giving you some of those ideas here today. Now, if you're reading the news, you know, you're being psychologically damaged every day by all the things coming at you. Inside Higher Ed, the Chronicle of Higher Ed are sending us mixed messages. Inside Higher Ed, June 10th, online learning is not the future. No, it's face-to-face -face courses. Fast forward 10 days later, the Chronicle of Higher Ed, sorry, not so sorry, online learning is here to stay. Well, six days later, not 10, it's here to stay. Who do we believe? Well, we believe in both. We're gonna have face-to-face. -face. We're gonna have blended. We're gonna have fully online. We're gonna have more of everything. We're gonna be teaching all formats and, and new ones will emerge. We won't give up on the past, but we'll embrace the future. And today is about that embracement in many ways. If you really wanna embrace the future, you have to take a look at what people are doing already what the knowledgeable, really smart folks in Canada from the Commonwealth of Learning are doing. Go to col.org. You can just skip the rest of the summer and read everything they have on the website. It is phenomenal. They have resources like you wouldn't believe for helping young girls and boys get educated in the uh, Global South or helping teach us how to do blended learning or fully on learning in their MOOCs, their uh, technology enhanced MOOCs with Athabasca University in O Canada. You can see my friend Asha Kanwar on the left and Sanjaya Mishra on the right. They're offering webinars on how to teach online. Take a look, they're free. Why are people doing stuff that costs money? We go to the Commonwealth of Learning and, and they're phenomenally dedicated people. And they have chapters in both my last books. And here's a couple of their reports with Tony Bates. And Tony and I are two of the people doing things for the Commonwealth of Learning and for Contact North in Canada. Tony's 82 years old and still going at it. One more six months to go, he told me the other day. As a, he has a free book, Teaching in the Digital Age. Download Tony's book. Definite, it's a definite read. And all the other reports. And Commonwealth of Learning has a journal called Journal of Learning for Development that's free as well. If you want to go to the eastern side of Canada, stop in Vancouver along the way. Now, by the way, Commonwealth of Learning helps all the former British colonies, Jamaica and Malaysia and, and India and so forth. Contact North is helping people in Ontario and now around the world with these free webinars and many resources that you can download. If you go to those two sites alone, Canadians have always been leading the way with the Australians, with distance learning and the UK. Those three countries have always set the pace. And now, of course, India and China and so forth. The US is lagged behind all the time. But we're here to catch up today because we have places like Indiana University creating websites like Professorpedia and Keep Teaching. Go to keepteaching.iu.edu and find some strategies to help your instructors or to help yourself learn to teach online. And thank you, IU people working for Stacey Maroney and others who have attended this session. And you've not attended one of mine previously? Ah, and there's another person, ah, me, uh, Super Traveling Edman. Go to my YouTube channel. 
I've tried to repurpose videos that have been done by Dallas Community College on blended learning and new technologies, and I've made a series of playlists of them. I've created 27 videos on how to teach online. You can go to my homepage and get them, but maybe they're a little old. But what, we, what we're all striving for are new models of motivation and engagement. We don't want kids coming in with boxes over their heads or parents climbing the walls, handing the answers to students. They shouldn't need that. They should be so engaged in their learning that they should want to learn, not be forced to learn or forced to cheat like these kids were doing. I apologize to the people, my friends in India have come to watch this, but I've got the news online. This is what they show me. We want new models of education. And so my friends, Chris Didi at Harvard, Scott McLeod at University of Colorado, Denver, Kunya Mishra at Arizona State, and Young Zhao at University of Kansas, and Sheng Yi Chen from East China Normal University, we've banded together to create silver lining for learning every Saturday, Eastern time at 5.30 p.m. You can watch our show. We have different guests coming in from around the world, including the Commonwealth of Learning, including the uh, ISTE, International Society of Technology and Education, talking about issues and new models of education. We have sideshows as well, not only the Saturday show, but we had one just a couple of days ago, interviews of people in India and in Pakistan and all around the world, and a blog. And we have people blog for us. So the so Silver Lining for Learning is a new entity, 15 episodes in. Take a look, come visit us, suggest an episode. It, it's been so popular that my friend Edgar Leone has created his own for Latin America at the University of Caribbean University in Puerto Rico. So we're all concerned about engagement. What did Jean-Luc Picard say in Star Wars, in Star Trek? Engage. In. Engage. Engage. Can you all say it with me on the count of three? One, two, three, and engage. And by the way, in the chat window right now, if you're a Star Wars fan, you can let Merve and Mena and Sarah know that you're a big Star Wars fan. If not, don't say anything in the chat window. And by the way, the Q&A is open there too. So you can go in the chat or the Q&A and so forth. So we're gonna look at motivation. Again, my Tech Variety book gets at motivation with 10 motivational principles. If you're not motivated, I don't know, maybe I'll give you some candy or something else. I have some chocolates. Anyhow, Jerry Brophy says there are certain things we need to motivate people. Feedback being one, enthusiasm being one, rewards, fun, fantasy, choice, challenge. A lot of things that motivate people. What I've tried to do is create a model or framework that umbrellas a lot of different techniques. You do not have to use all of them. This is not hmm, the typical instructional design model where you're gonna have to use everything I teach or talk about today. Use what works for you. This is not, this is not a uh, pre-prescribed curriculum. This is not a pre-can. Uh, use your creativity to take the, some of these ideas and modify them, reshape them, expand them, shrink them down, do whatever you want. It's just one way of thinking about the world of learning environments. That's all we can create is learning environments. We can challenge students and we can support them in their challenges. There's only two things that teachers do, challenge, and support in the challenges. You can give up on all the rest of the crap that people teach you, that's all that we do. We assist in the learning process. And if you assist in the learning process, you will get people who are intrinsically motivated. They'll pursue their passions, their volitions, their conations, their striving to seek new challenges out, to maximize what they have, to exceed expectations, not go for the bottom, the lower end. So the Tech Variety Mo book can be downloaded right now. If you're Chinese, download it Chinese. If, if you're Spanish, talk to my friend Edgar Leon, who's translating, he's, got, he's created hundreds of activities in, in Spanish in the last couple of weeks. I can, I can send me an email if you uh, speak Spanish um, and I'll send you what he's done so far. 
my email is listed on slide one, it's listed at the end. So in the book, we talk about risk, time, and cost, and student-centeredness. Every idea in the book is evaluated from the degree of time, risk, and cost. We want low risk, low cost, low time activities. Hopefully, hopefully, some people want high risk, high cost, high time things, like me and Tom and, uh, and Ramsey and others out there. We're looking for really risky and uh, stuff to do. So let's give some examples. Let's talk about what I've seen, what I've heard. Not every one of the ideas I'm gonna show you, I've tried out, but a good percent I have. Probably about 70% of the ideas I show, maybe 80%. But some of these are from the medical field and from other disciplines as well, from business, some sociologies and so forth. Now I'm trained in educational psychology and before that business. And so I have some more examples in those areas. And now in instructional technology, which I teach, we get to use technology tools like Slido. And our friends in Singapore, and by the way, uh, are here with us. I think Prima is with us today and Mahana and others. They've, they've brought in some of their friends from the Ministry of Education. If my Singaporean friends came in late, I was playing a song from Singapore, from people from Singapore around the world to start. When I was in Singapore last time, three years ago, now four, coming up on four, they used Slido with all the keynotes. They had the audience type in questions for the keynote. And the most popular questions were rated high. They got put to the top and were asked of the keynotes at the end. So it's a, it's a way to sort through the audience issues or questions and then find out anonymously what people favor. So one person doesn't dominate the discussion. And you, I've used it in my class to, to rate where the agenda, what we should cover that day, uh, where we might go, ideas the students liked, uh, what I might cover next time. There's all sorts of things you can use Slido for. They get a little code that they type in their mobile or their laptop to use Slido. Flipgrid's another tool. And Slido is a freemium model. And the same with Flipgrid. Although Flipgrid is free for educators because Microsoft has bought it. My colleague, Charlie Miller, who was at the University of Minnesota, the University of Minnesota, where they talk funny up there, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of Nor former Norwegians and Scandinavians living up in, uh, in Minnesota. And, and he, in his spare time, he built something called Flipgrid, which is threaded video discussions. And so my students this semester, we are reading a bunch of articles and every once in a while we would have a Flipgrid discussion of the articles, or we would, they did some introductions of themselves of the articles. And so we, we, ha we use Flipgrid instead of text, instead of typing, you talk. It's really cool. And you talk for about a minute and a half. You cut people off after about a minute and a half. And we had a lot of articles from, my, from myself and from my colleague, Dr. Mimi Lee. We had some from Dr. Ren uh, Reynolds and Reeves. Well, Dr. Lee couldn't come in, so we used Flipgrid to give her feedback and ask questions on her articles. So that's one way that you can use it. If you can't get a guest, you can give the guests the questions through Flipgrid or have the guests become inspired with the students in your class. Again, it is a free tool. It's used a lot in K-12, but I was using it early on to start conferences out. If Tom Rees remembers back in 2013, we had student uh, all the pre-conference discussion in Flipgrid. We can do course introductions to give students a safe tone or climate. Here's some nursing educators at the University of Texas Arlington and at other universities. They're introducing the nursing content before students arrive so you feel a safe harbor, if you will. Our business school, Kelly School of Business, does this for all the faculty. They introduce the course in an, in an online video format. All MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, have an introduction. Polling is a tool that works for number two. So number one is toner climate, having a safe climate like Maslow says. Some people say number one is the most important. And I have got, went from 30% drops online to zero drops by using number one. 
having students write their expectations, their commitments, their favorite websites, a cafe, all these kind of things you can do with number one. I like expectations because then I can point out we're going to meet those or their commitments because if they post commitments, they're less likely to drop my course. So have them put in Canvas or Blackboard or Moodle, their commitments and expectations. They work all the time. Okay. Number two gets that feedback. It could be student feedback to you or feedback from you to students. But if you are only one giving feedback, you will die teaching online. Get instructor feedback, expert feedback, peer feedback, system feedback, and self-feedback. Poll Everywhere and MicroPoll are tools that students can give feedback on their mobile and it can go automatically into your lesson. So Flinders University was using this <clears throat> with their medical education, as you see here. If you click that link, the case is described for you. So when you download the slides, you can check out what they're doing, simultaneous polling in a video conferencing class across Australia. It's rather kind of interesting get people to be active in the remote sites by having polls going on. And you could collect that data, whatever it is, and just display it on the fly. Vaccaro is a tool for you to give feedback to your students <clears throat> without typing. So you give voice feedback, hit the recording, give voice feedback and hit stop, and it gives you a URL. And there's no limit to the number of minutes that you can be giving feedback in Vaccaro. And it's free. How much better can that be than free? Now, when things are free one day, the next day it often is not free. So I have a backup plan. Quizlet is another tool that's free. The largest quizzing and testing system in the world is now available on mobile devices. And you can create questions or use existing questions in Quizlet. It's a no-brainer if you have to if you have a lot of declarative knowledge to be tested on. Students love to be tested before the exam. There was research done when I arrived in 1992 at Indiana, people were looking at these online databases of questions already, almost three decades ago. And they found, when did the students use the online exam questions? Eh, 24 hours before the exam. They might have been on there for months, but they use them just before the exam. Another way to give feedback or to help your students out, because number two is encouragement, is to use tools like Jing and ScreenView or Screener, Screencast-O-Matic, to do voiceovers, to do tutorials, to do how-tos. So here's some nursing educators again on the left-hand side, giving tutorials to the students of what they're gonna be walking through or doing and putting those tutorials up online as support mechanisms. If you're using a new activity, if you're using a new technology, why not give a tutorial? Why not give a demonstration? Why not give a how-to? Number three gets at curiosity, intrigue, and unknowns. Now, if you've taken my class with a 100-page syllabus <laughs> called the Monster Syllabus, you will know that I have a lot of tidbits, a lot of news stories. So I embed articles that get students to see the news is relevant to their, to their course. The daily life news is it, every day there's something in the news that relates to the class. So if we're talking about internet bandwidth in my emerging technologies class, we can talk about the girl living in a tree. Last week, this is in the news last week in the University of uh, Malaysia Sabah, she couldn't get internet in her local community. So she went and lived in a tree for a night with, with you know, killer bees going all around her head. And she was able to get so much viral attention that the, the service provider has just in the last week provided internet for the whole community. So this went viral anyhow. So getting students to see things that are happening in their real life before they read about it in the abstract research papers and book chapters and technical reports and white papers and all that other stuff. You know, they can go and read about the University of Massachusetts and the University of Minnesota and University of Newcastle doing research on 3D glasses on cuttlefish and other 
um, species underwater to look at eye vision and to show depth perception and get people intrigued about um, the experiments that are going on. You know, every day there's something in the news that can get your students excited about what's going on. And whether it's educational technology or it's biography, uh, biology or physics or COVID, you know, they can read about the 101 year old woman who was born on a ship during the last pandemic and just beat coronavirus. Or they can read about or learn about Indiana's new art museum, the Eskenazi Museum of Art, which lets you explore the art with internet, with the internet connecting to, through clicks and be able to rotate and look at objects and read about them and so forth. So get people curious about art, get people curious about science, about math, about engineering, about fitness. You can read about the gentleman who at age 102 retired from running marathons and last year at age 104 came out of retirement to run another one. Now I've run for 101 days in a row and I'm not in as good a shape as he is, trust me. When his entire family died when he was 80 or had died by that time and he decided to take up running and he's been a marathon runner for the last 24 years. The woman on the left was the first woman to run in the Boston Marathon. She was dressed as a man 50 years ago. And a couple of years later, uh, years ago, she ran it again in her 70s. And this woman is the world's fastest 100 meter dash person at, at over 100 years old, the fastest centenarian. Get people excited about fitness, about athletics, about photography, media. Here we have a picture of the with the oldest, the oldest picture of a human being in Paris, 1838. And you can see the woman shining the man's shoes there. Here we've got old camera equipment. Find the old information, history. History excites people. I am excited about it, I don't know about you. Put in the chat window if you love history and, and what kind of history you like. I'm kind of curious what kind of history, what aspects of history you're into, what do you like? Number four gets at variety fun, fantasy. So Merve likes to use Animaker. So Merve's in, she's one of my uh, people in the chat. She's created an example in Turkish. If you can understand Turkish, click on the YouTube link. Animaker is a cloud-based do-it-yourself video maker that lets you put props and transitions and images and characters in so you can, you can create scenarios, you can create events students do summaries of what they've learned in my class using Animaker, for instance, okay? Susie Grosnet might be in here, a former student at the University of Houston. In November, October, she created a kind of like a Jeopardy quiz game show using PowerPoint and using jib jab videos where you would pick a category and you would get a set of questions or you would get a prize. And so people would pick different questions and we were teaching about international book writing. Susie, by the way, has a really great book called Universal Access Through Instruction, Inclusive Instructional Design, International Perspectives on Universal Design for Learning with Rutledge. So if you're into UDL, Universal Design for Learning, you should get her book. Um, and by the way, if you're really into this pedagogy stuff, Michael Sharples has a new book, Practical Pedagogy, 40 New Ways to Teach and Learn. Mike Sharples from the Open U in the UK, just retired. Brilliant, brilliant books. Both of these, highly, highly recommend. I got two more to recommend at the end of the day um, for you. Anyhow, Susie created this wonderful game show. So if you, if you click on a category, you could win a book. And so we would, you know, we would give in my world's open book or some other book, <clears throat> our new MOOCs and open ed around the world book and so forth, or in the global South. And then they pick a category and get questions and we'd answer the questions. They pick another category and we have a jib jab video. Um, then they pick another category, another category, we made it fun. Not just, you know, we made Q and A fun, made it different, made a variety out of it. Merve, when she was in one of my classes, the first class, in fact, that she took with me, she created a Jeopardy Rocks kind of um, game on learning theories. 
And as you picked items off the list, you could gain certain points. Bandura conducted a study, da da da, what was the name of the study? So free tool, go to jeopardyrocks.com and you can create Jeopardy type videos for your students. Another no brainer. Have fun in your class the first five minutes or last five minutes. Just something to add on at the beginning or end of your class. If you like this randomness notion, you can, you can roll the dice and see what comes up. Oh, number eight, okay. We'll do item number eight in the agenda. You roll the dice again. Number five, oh, we'll do item number five in the agenda. Well, this, this tool, random.org, lets you do just that. You don't need dice. You can go to the random tool and just, you know, just go ahead and click the button or whatever it's going to be. And it can randomize groups. It can randomize who's going to present that day. So you've had 10 students or 20 students. You didn't pick on Bill to go first. The randomizer picked on Bill to go first and Brian to go last. So it has dice. It has a coin flip. It has a 99 second countdown bomb. So I give students 99 seconds to talk. When the timer is done, they're done talking. Well, some just variety and change it up. I've, I'm teaching a class right now in reverse that I taught for over 25 years one way. I'm now teaching it the opposite way. Change it up or you're going to get stale or put things in wheel decide and let wheel decide how it's going to do it. You put the items in the wheel and you see what spins out. Change it up. My, my student, uh, Kendam Geibach from Bhutan showed me this tool one day. Again, I don't find all these tools. People show me and bring them. Um, Kahoot, I met the guy who built Kahoot. He's a Norwegian guy spending time at, um, in California at uh, Riverside, Cal State, River, uh, University of California, Riverside. And he built this tool just for fun, just to see what's going on. And, and the whole world's using it. Kahoot's a free tool. It, when I was in Singapore four years ago, when I was in Bangkok four years ago, everybody was using Kahoot in, in Southeast Asia. Couldn't believe how much it had spread. So you enter a code in, you enter your name in, and you type the, you know, you click on an answer, A, B, C, or D, and those who get it right get points. <clears throat> and students love this tool. They want to get their names underneath, you know, um, at the end, on the screen, it has the top point getters. And the students want their pictures with it. So Kahoot's a free tool. Another free tool is Future Me. I write a letter to my future self in a year with my plans for the coming year. And then I get an email from myself. Um, and, and I look and did I accomplish those things? So it sets goals up for me. You can have students writing letters to you as the instructor. Uh, but <clears throat> I like writing them to myself. You might find all sorts of creative uses for this, maybe a semester tool, the future after five weeks or after eight weeks. Number five gets that autonomy. So number four was variety and novelty. Number five is autonomy and choice. Enrolling in a MOOC and reflecting on it. I have my students who take a MOOC on learning theories while they're taking my learning theory course. And if they complete the whole MOOC and get a certificate and write a reflection paper, they can delete the final assignment. If they don't complete the whole thing and write a reflection paper, they can delete one of the midterms. So in effect, they're taking two courses instead of one. And there's a lot better instructors out there than me from Harvard and Yale and Stanford and so forth. And so uh, it's a wonderful way that if you're teaching exercise and fitness, you can see all these different uh, MOOCs available from EDX and Coursera and Canvas and so forth. Yesterday, Sunday, I got an email from EDX saying, you can take the science of beer. Now, I haven't had a beer in six weeks, and they're not selling it around here for whatever reason. And I grew up in Milwaukee, where that's all we do is drink beer. Well, the guy there in the middle is from my alma mater, University of Wisconsin Whitewater, and he teaches a MOOC called Beer Matters. <laughs> and he visits uh, breweries with the students when they can meet, when there's not COVID, they drive to them. And I, I went to his last class and met up with him a couple of weeks back. The science of beer making, cannibalist cultivation, so marijuana. Now, 20, 30 years ago, you wouldn't see Harvard and Stanford and so forth teach them about cannabis cultivation and processing. But today you have the science of parenting and 
learning Italian language and learning to play the piano and guitar and so forth. And they have summer discounts on these things. They have um, Cyber Monday discounts after Thanksgiving in America. One thing I, I use with autonomy and choice is having students track the life of a scientist to follow someone in Twitter or biography.com and do a, a paper about their lives. Someone who's famous in the field and write to them if they're still alive. Bring them into our class and have them talk to our class. Getting students to be apprenticed by somebody else beyond the instructor um, and, and to get move into the discipline, if you will. One of my students, Umida, who might be with us here, and Oscar, who also might be with us here, Oscar from Turkey, Umida from Uzbekistan, they said to me, Dr. Bonk, your assignments are too easy. I don't want to do a hundred word glossary. I want to do a glossary that's multimedia, that has videos in them that explain the concepts, the news and books and pictures and so forth. And they did. It was stunning. And if I had time to show it, um, go to, uh, click on the links there and you can explore and take a look. So we're at a point where we're going to do some polling, poll number five and about any light bulbs going off in your head. So let's see if we can get poll number five. Um, oh, we didn't do uh, poll number five before. Let's do this one here. Um, have you ever taught a fully online course? I forgot to do this one earlier when we were doing polling. We have 296 right now. We get four more, we get to 300. Okay. So we'll end the polling here and we'll share the results. And we have uh, 64, just a couple, 18%, many. Only a couple percent, not at all. 28% are one to try. Interesting, a lot of people want to get at this. Now let's try for the other poll, if I can call that one up and launch it. Any light bulbs going off in your head? Yes, many, no, there's no hope for this idiot presenting. No, my brain's not working, oh, oh, oh. We've got one person whose brain's not working, okay. Ah. <laughs> Well, that's a good sign. Only me and the per and one other person don't have a brain working today. All right, we'll end the poll here and we'll share the results and you can see several, several, maybes. Yes, definitely. It's okay. Well, all right, we're rolling now. We'll stop the sharing there. If I can click right. Okay. So let's go on to part two of the tech variety model. You see the man in the upper left? His name is Dr. Mike Melinda. And he taught the class that I was gonna teach one semester. I hadn't taught in you know, the whole time I've been at IU. So what did I do? I brought the guy who built the course into my class. And he explained the purpose of the class. We were using Adobe Connect at the time and later Zoom, he came back in Zoom here. And he explained the purpose of the class. I brought students who graduated into the class. I brought guest speakers like Susie Bourne, my former student from Bangkok. She might be with us right now. Hi, Susie Bourne. She did wiki book research with me. I brought Paul Kim and Tom Rees into my class. You can see them there, my former, uh, my colleague, Chris Devers, and so forth. We were using Zoom a couple of months ago to talk about mobile technologies. I brought Charlie Miller in who built Flipgrid. Just pop him in. Tell us about Flipgrid. How'd you build Flipgrid? What's What's life like to be an entrepreneur, to leave a professor job and take, create something changing the world? I brought Dr. Marty Siegel, who created the original Plato, helped create the Plato system at the University of Illinois and many, many other things, who's retiring from my campus. I brought him in week one to explain the history of the field out. I brought Jim and Agaya, who took and passed 300 MOOCs, took 700 MOOCs in Nigeria to explain what it was like to take that and then I visited with him at a conference in the UK in Scotland. Um, so relevant, meaningful, bring real world people into your class, make it relevant to them. Or use Animaker, we showed Animaker earlier, to create a video tutorial 
like this professor Marisol did in Puerto Rico, she was training other faculty how to use mobile or how to do podcasts, how to do blended learning. She did professional development videos in Animaker to get other teachers interested in teaching with technology during COVID and after. My friend Mark Braun, who recently retired as well from Indiana, creates um, first year medical student cases in anatomy and physiology and so forth. A man with a chest pain, a woman with a lump in her breast, a man with a cough. He creates, you know, blood slides and and blood pressure and heart rate, and you get all this data and have to make a decision about the patient. It takes them seven hours to create each case and they're free on the web. Every discipline probably has tens if not hundreds of cases online that you can use. You just need to spend an hour with a flashlight in the closet exploring the web and finding these things. There's lots of this stuff out there. Lots of, this is all, you just, just search and find. Edit Wikipedia pages. My students edited a Wikipedia page, then we wrote a wiki book together and edited a, a wiki book. Um, actually, we edited a wiki book from a professor at the University of Georgia, where Tom Reeves is, and then, um, then we wrote our own, actually. And it's a phenomenal experience to see students edit a Wikipedia page. It's, you know, text is changeable. It's a constructivistic notion to that. Um, Another tool that Merve has told me about is Trillo. Now, I haven't used Trillo, but it's a way of creating um, projects, project management. It's a project management and team management tool so that you can see what your team is working on a particular week. As you click on a card, up comes additional information, links to videos, links to um, pictures. It, it could be a way to assemble your lectures. Maybe you have four lectures coming up for the week or this month. Uh, those cards are each could be each portion a, a portion of your lecture notes, if you will. So you can use it for a group a project overview and then brainstorming, then research, then rough draft, then final draft. You can use it for newsletters for parents and for your your class. Trello is a freemium tool. There's a free version and a paid version as well. One um, professor at Griffith University is. Uh, sent me a note last month. She says, Kurt, you need to think about using oral assessments. Oral assessments meaning meeting your students live in Zoom or other places and giving them an oral exam instead of a written one. I think she's nuts. I think she's absolutely crazy. And she's in Australia. I think maybe she's at Griffith. So maybe they do things a little different in the down under. Um, but she said it's more efficient. In 10 minutes, you can find out the equivalent of a 4,000 word essay. And so they use it a lot in their business school. If you click on this link, when you download the slides, they'll explain oral exams and the assessments. She's got it all detailed if you want to explore that. Um, I've, I do some things orally. I meet students in half hour blocks, um, having them explain their projects, but not, it's not necessarily an assessment or a test. Another interactive and collaborative technology uh, is Google Documents, which many of you use, I'm sure. But you might not be using Meeting Words or Pirate Pad or Now Comment or Mixing. Little sticky note wikis where every team member contribution is a different color. It's a, you kind of little fun meetup kinds of tools out there to negotiate meetings and so forth. If you don't like Google Docs, which I don't like Google Docs, I was experimenting in 1990 with collaborative technologies around the world. And there are tools better than Google Docs on the Apple, like um, Collaborative Writer and Aspects and other things. Uh, we've gone in backwards in terms of collaboration online, to be honest. You think it's cool stuff today. You should have seen what, what was available 30 years ago when I was a Mac user, I'm no longer. Uh, interactive and collaborative, guest speaker quotes. My friend Ray Junko is a, is a Twitter researcher, a Facebook researcher. And he said, Kurt, I'd love to come to your class, but I have no time to create my talk. I said, no problem, Ray. My students will create your talk for you. So in the chat window, my students put their favorite quotes of his articles. And, and they create a, power, a, a PowerPoint slide deck of his research, his slides of his, of his own research, his figures and tables. And, and he could say pass on anything he didn't want to talk about. 
It was the most spontaneous interactive session I think I've ever had. It's a top 10 anyhow. Guest speaker quotes, guest speaker visuals. It works, try it out. Nucleino is a tool I used last fall with Merve and Mena. Mena might've found this tool or maybe Merve did, but Mena went to Wayne State University and she was using the same book that I was using at Indiana by Ellie Carr Chelman. It's a book that has debate topics in it, including a piece I think from Tom Reeves and Mike Melinda and, and many other famous folks. Well, in Nucleino, Nucleino is like a wiki tool and it's like a discussion tool and a brainstorming kind of tool. Um, and we had five groups, five from Indiana and five from Wayne State. We had five groups, group one, one group, one group uh, took the pro side, took the author side, and the response was by the other group. So in Indiana, students would be the, the author and the Wayne State could be the responder. And then the rejoinder would be the Indiana again. So we set it up and we did this twice. So one time the group was the responder and one time they were the author. They role played back and forth. And it was a really good way to talk about the articles and, and discuss them and issues and problems and so forth. Nucleino, it's not God's gift. It's not got all the bells and whistles and you can delete text by mistake. You know, it's like a wiki, you know, it's gone, but it did its function, it's pretty cool. So, you know, with caveats, I'd use it. Now, number seven also gets at interactive and collaborative technologies in engineering and in science. My friend Susan Aldridge at Drexel Online, she's president of Drexel Online, created a website called Virtually Inspired. It's a whole suite of free tools, labs and simulations and so forth, She's indexed all the best of the best from all around the world. And so, you know, if you teach engineering, if you teach science and about embryos or um, nursing or, you know, medical school and so forth, there's all sorts of simulations and virtual labs that you can get access to if you teach data security and so forth. You know, there, there's a lot of tools today out there to engage, not only to make it interactive and collaborative, Again, virtuallyinspired.org, be inspired. If there's anything about today's session, you know, should wear your pink wigs and inspire people, you know? Uh, be inspired. Engage, engage your students in something. You know, uh, for nursing training, uh, patient simulations. My former student, Kira King, working at Connective, has created branching simulations uh, training for nurses and for other people in the medical field, virtual patient simulations with online assessments that simulate authentic patient encounters. Get students to engage with these patients uh, and make decisions about them, be coached in those decisions. And in healthcare, uh, there are a number of simulations out there that, that um, if trauma units, for instance, emergency units, um, birthing units and so forth. There's another website from the University of Colorado that's free. It's called PHET that has little simulations or micro worlds in physics, biology, chemistry, and earth science and math for sound and waves, energy, motion, light. And so you can explore these little worlds and download these things uh, for upper level high school and introductory college classes. Another tool that's out there that has a lot of changes lately are timelines. There are many of these timeline tools that no longer exist like Dippity and um, what is the other one? Uh, uh, Simile from MIT. But there are other ones that have taken their place. Proceedin uh, has, has bought out one of these tools. They're free timeline tools that let you, you set up um, and your students to create a timeline for the field or a timeline for the article that they're writing. Also what's emerging are a lot of simulations of history sites. Rome Reborn, the professor who built Rome Reborn moved to Indiana recently and has created several other websites where you can explore archeological digs, if you will, uh, in Rome or Greece or other parts of the world, Peru and so forth and getting people to be in a semi-authentic 
um, not high fidelity, but better fidelity world than just reading a textbook, if you will. And other ways to get people to experience those real world is to be in a virtual world, conducting an orchestra. We played orchestra at the beginning, if you were with us early on, a virtual orchestra, three or four of them I had examples. If you didn't see the music at the start, if you didn't come in and listen to that, download the slides, a lot of fun, take a look. Um, hear about Indiana University. Or explore a virtual heart in, uh, with augmented reality today and virtual augmented headsets that you can wear to explore that. Number nine gets at challenge or controversy. Having students take a pro side and a con side of an issue. In my intro class to, learn, to um, instructional technology, they have to do this for their midterm, debate topics and create media around those topics. Many disciplines are set up with a pro and con side to issues. In the healthcare field, there's all sorts of pro and con kinds of controversies today. Uh, that you could set up for your class to discuss and get them excited and engaged in the topic before they come to class or after they leave that session of class or get it into uh, a virtual world where they assume the persona of someone who's 74 years old or 90 years old or older and has a Ill particular illness, maybe has incurable lung cancer and what it's like to get bad news from a doctor that they're going to be transitioning them to the hospice care. They, there's no hope beyond in that virtual world or virtual space and how you make that decision. Controversy, challenge, tension. Well, in terms of challenge, my friend Paul Kim has built the Stanford Mobile Inquiry Learning Environment or SMILE. SMILE is a question asking tool and question evaluation tool. He has built an AI system within SMILE to evaluate the level of questions. And so now you can challenge your kids to ask level one questions, declarative facts questions, level two, level three, level four, level five. You can download SMILE right now for your mobile, for your laptop. It's a free tool to get kids asking questions, evaluating questions, instead of just answering basic facts. Get them engaged in the learning process. Georgia Tech has a tool they built called Reflect that gets the students at Georgia Tech working in small teams to solve wicked, what they call wicked problems in politics, in education, and so forth. The University of Michigan has built a similar tool called Viewpoint that enables their business st school students to be involved in leadership challenges or crisis management. Number 10 gets at data collection tools, databases. My students create a, um, a database in Pinterest, for instance. My students do a mind map of the discussion for the week. So the, the database in Pinterest are all the news articles, by the way. A mind map um, of the discussion for the week. A timeline. My students did a wonderful paper summarizing the, the field of emerging technology and created a mind map of the field. Um, designing products using Again, that Canva tool, Merve used the Canva tool in her midterm assignment, getting at definitions of educational technology. Students can create brochures and infographics. Today, students love infographics and brochures and timeline. My students write chapters for a wiki book as a final assignment. That's an option. All these are final assignment options in my class. They don't have to do it. They can do a website development if they want to. So those are the 10 principles of the tech variety model. Tone, encouragement, curiosity, variety, autonomy, relevance, interactivity, engagement, tension, and yielding products. So what I want you to do in the polls that we have here is go to poll number seven, and which one of those principles do you see as the most crucial? And I'll tell you which one is downloaded the most. Interesting. Okay. Wow. Wow. This is really interesting. 
We are at how many people? 269. Okay, I'm going to have to end the polling here and share the results. And you can see encouragement or feedback. It's the number one answer and engagement is right behind curiosity, engagement, and encouragement. Interesting. Okay, variety, tone, all those, interactivity, and so forth. Um, I want you to, to also to commit to one of those. Which one of those are you gonna commit to using in your class? Maybe four of those, maybe three of those, maybe five of those, you don't have to use all 10, but they're a guide. This is a guide, not a prescription. I don't believe in prescriptions, only guides. So for the few minutes I have remaining, I'll, I'll mention the, the R2D2 model with you. Um, and, and for a second, if you haven't seen my, my lightsaber, my students got me one of these. They saw I was missing a lightsaber. But no, I have a real, like, I have a real lightsaber that doesn't make it through airports anymore. Oh, there it goes. All right. Oh, it works again. <laughs> okay, wow, it wasn't working before. Get my Death Star working too. Um, so we'll go back to share my screen here for a second. And so the R2D2 model, and go back to the, the book I had up there, Empowering Online Learning, relates to that, is read, reflect, display, and do. Four parts, you can go in any order. In the book, we have 25 activities in each one. With the tech variety, we have 10 activities in each one. 10 times 10 is 125 times four is 100, 100 in each book. Um, so we have engaged the book. Engagement. So my colleague, Ka Jong and I wrote this book uh, back in 2008, I think it came out. Uh, we've had the idea for a couple of years prior. And um, it's not a learning style model, but if you want to use a learning style, it's okay. Um, I'm an educational psychologist, we don't believe in that. But the first one gets at spoken words or written words or written expressions, right? My friend, Jordy LaForge there, I was standing next to him one day down at uh, South by Southwest in Austin. I didn't know who he was because he didn't have his visor on, but uh, he had reading range. If you know this is Captain Picard. Reading, reading, constantly reading with M or listening to words in NPR, um, podcasts or reading blogs, or following someone in Twitter. Or I don't trust you, Q. Observational learners, reflection, reflect, reflect, reflect. The most important thing is reflection. Read, reflect, display, and do. The one, or the one thing I, I forgot to do often was reflect. And so I'm making a point to reflect, observe, reflect, observe when I try something else. I don't trust you, Q. So phase two gets that reflection. This professor at Notre Dame teaches religion, and in here she has a set of big questions for students to reflect on. There is a website called BQO, Big Questions Online. You can create a BQO in your classes and have a, one student or two students a week post the BQOs, the big questions that they should ask, or post the infographic that they're to reflect on for the week. There's another professor at Notre Dame that created a syllabus that's an infographic instead of having a normal syllabus. You can also have students do video dialogues, dialogues on videos. I think this was created at Columbia Teachers College where you watch a video on YouTube and you have discussions on them, not just talking head things anymore, or talk about cases student life cases from the British Medical Association. Program complete. Enter when ready. Number three is flowcharts, pictures, films. So watching migration patterns change due to climate change, visual depictions of science, or visual depictions of words you're using in your class syllabus if you teach nursing or um, medicine or fitness or education. My a couple of my students this semester didn't do well in the online discussion forums. They were kind of slacking off. And I said to them in the last week, I said, you can make it all up by creating mind maps and word maps of the existing discussions. And they went to town. They had a fabulous time summarizing the discussion using concept maps and the words that people were using. 
They didn't like the discussion with other people, but they loved working on the discussion in a separate way. I found what made learning exciting for them. And these are some of the mind maps that they created from the course. And they wrote reflection papers on these, actually. It was a wonderful activity. Another thing you can do is have a video for a macro context to anchor instruction, a short video from the BBC or CNN, and have discussion wrap around it, a short video in TED or TED-Ed, and then have discussion wrap around. I've written several papers on using video as a context for learning or having an animation of data from February, looking at the number one cause of deaths in the world is suicide and malaria, to June 22nd is now COVID is the number one cause of deaths. Or animations like the World Mapper. The World Mapper lets you see uh, images, pictures of data. You can visualize that data. So you see initially COVID was in China, now it's in the United States, in Europe, and Alaska. World Mapper has the same data for public school spending, for pancreatic cancer deaths, all sorts of things. You can go to the World Mapper. It's a database of that. <clears throat> you could also see this displayed in videos today. You can watch COVID unfold over time, starting in China and now where it is today, watching that video or seeing a, another animation of data uh, from the NBC News, watching it spread. Uh, or Euro news, watching the U.S. take off over time from uh, March 26th to May 18th, watching what happened due to <clears throat> somewhat incompetence, or seeing, you know, a video um, from uh, uh, Stanford. And I had this video up. I was going to show this, and maybe I I know we're out of time. So um, where are we here? Yeah, seeing these little videos. And watching this. <laughs> sharing let's see i think we're about out of time so um my my point was you can create short mi mini animated videos to display some of that let's see if we go here medical training videos concept mapping mind mapping tools there are a number of tools out there for mind mapping and concept mapping bubble.us glyphy spicy nodes and so forth uh, there are a number of places today if you go to a conference where they draw a talk this woman drew our second um, silver lining for learning whole session a couple of weeks ago from india she shared it with us you can draw talks to visualize the talk i'll skip that i'll skip make it so the fourth principle of the r2d2 model is doing something all stations prepare doing something decision making around cases sampling student work in a project gallery having student work on display having students create a set of podcasts or videos and uh, as a final project. In this case, my students had a maker lab. She did a set of videos around the maker lab. Having students create videos that summarize the learning in the class. Having students design something. So anyways, the, the R2D2 model, the tech variety model are two ways to slice through all the things you can do. And I'll put up a poll here again. Which one of these So, how many ideas did you get from this talk? We've gone over a five minutes. <clears throat> Okay.
I'll share the results. Most of you got five to 10 or more than 10, just one, okay. Um, but most of you got more than four ideas, okay. We'll do another poll here. Um, see if I can get another one to show. Number nine, I'm curious which idea you like, Tech Variety or R2D2? It's neck and neck. But as you can see here, the tech variety or both won out. Some people be creative and find unique ways to create their own uh, model. Okay, um, let's see if I got another poll in here. Let's see if, are you excited to any, try anything out that you've heard today? Okay, many of them, several of them. Yes, one, hopefully soon. Okay, brain is not working. <laughs> one, two people with internet issues. I apologize for that, but it, I get it's not my fault. Okay, we'll take a look at this one, share the results. Many of them, many ideas. Okay, um, let's go to the next poll. Ah, let's see about this one here. Does this give you a headache? <laughs> oh, this is going to all day. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. Yes, but I'm still excited to try things out. 39 of you so far. Okay, wow. You got a headache, but you're trying, you want to try it out anyways. Couple of you, 90 of you want to go all day. Okay, we'll stop and we'll share some results there. Okay, just about right. Not sure. Okay, I'll stop sharing. We got one more poll, I think. Maybe two more polls. The last poll this is the last poll. And um, did you get this poll, number 12? Okay, there we go. Okay. All right, well, and polling and share the results, some definites, some would come to a follow-up session. Okay, great. Um, that's the last poll that we have for you. I wanna recommend a couple of books for you. I said I'd recommend a couple. Joshua Kim's book on learning innovations, the future of higher ed, Brian Alexander, Academic Next, the future of higher ed, Johns Hopkins Press, thinking about where we are going in the future. I would recommend Sagata Mitra's School in the Cloud book as well, if you're in the K-12 space. Think about uh, the self-organized learning environments world. Uh, Joshua Kim writes for Inside Higher Ed, a free blog post every day. Brian Alexander on the right with the beard has a show in Shindig on Thursday. It's free, a futures forum. So we've done all these. Um, the world is open for all of you now. As you can see, my friends in Bangkok, my friends in Singapore, my friends in Indiana, my friends in the Philippines or in Taiwan, my friends in China, if you can all jump with me in the air one last time, we're at a jumping off point. We're not sure where we're gonna go. If everyone can stand up and stretch and jump and jump. 200 and some people with me jumping at once. One last time, jump. All the women jump. All the men jump. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, you can have a seat. Um, and those, those are people at South China Normal University in Guangzhou a few years ago, wondering what the heck I'm doing, taking pictures of me. No one's jumping at all. Hopefully one or two of you are jumping with me. Uh, but uh, we're at the end of this talk, found a little bit over.
let's see what's out there. Engage. online. My slides are at training share. Sarah will post them again in the chat window. They're downloadable. My papers are at publication share. My book, Tech Variety, is there. My emails, my homepage. So I want to, again, thank you all for so many people staying a little extra. Hopefully you don't have the summertime or wintertime blues if you're in the down under. Hopefully a Tech Variety R2-D2 can bring you out of that doldrums. Um, I'm going to stop sharing at this point and uh, say I've, I've had fun with you all. I hope you have had some fun too. This took a while to develop. Uh, the Tech Variety book was thought about in 2000 with Vanessa Denon under a bridge during a conference at AERA in New Orleans. It took me 14 years to write the book. She ended up being an editor of the book. Um, so it, it's, it didn't just happen like magic, but, um, but it's, it's, it's had 250,000 downloads as of a couple of years ago when the, we blew it up. It no longer counts how many downloads. So, um, hi, Jessica. Uh, again, thank you all. Susan, Sheehan, good to have you with us. Um, thanks. I'm, good thing, Grace. I'm glad you joined us from Taiwan. Xu Feng from Cortland. Thank you, all my friends. Um, if um, if you have uh, from Spain, we have folks from Calgary. Hopefully, I get back to Calgary someday. Toronto. Wow. Okay. I'm sorry I wasn't able to attend to the chat, but now I'm yours. Sarah, do you want to? say anything or comment before we go to chat and Q&A here? Sure. Um, well, just a, a quick thank you for this uh, amazing presentation. I know that I picked up a lot of uh, tips and, and tricks, and I'm sure everybody else did. I hope everyone else's brain is about to explode just like mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for sharing your expertise with us. and. Um, this this wonderful variety of of technology that everyone can use with their students to um, use for engagement which is wonderful and, and motivation um, we do have some uh, questions in the Q&A Mena and Merve were excellent at um, being able to keep up with some of the questions that came up. So we have a, a few in the queue right now. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want me to read them to you or do you want to pull them up on yourself? I think if you read them to me, it might be the better way to go. And by the way, you all have been bonked. So um, just give, if you need a bonk pin from surviving this webinar, we can see if we can manufacture them. I got this in Finland or where the bonk museum is. Um, <clears throat> it's a story for another day. Uh, thanks from Bangladesh. Okay, it's great to have people from Bangladesh in. Um, so, yeah, Sarah or Merve or Mena, any of you, I'll let you guys ask me the questions and then I'll answer them. Uh, Dr. Bong, one of the questions we didn't answer is about uh, exam and assessment. Uh, your uh, strategies and tips to evaluate to assess online students. To evaluate online students have to be a portfolio, number one. Uh, we need to think about having them package their portfolio of learning into maybe picking, you know, four or six of their best pieces uh, of the class, having them do summaries. I mean, don't assess everything students do or you will die. So instead of reading every blog post, have them write a, ref a super summary of their blogs. Instead of having you read every Canvas post, have them write a summary of the discussion, including quotes from it, and assess that. Uh, um, uh, have them write about what they learned from their peers and assess that. Uh, so, you know, online students expect to be assessed in everything they do. So if you do blogging, have them get a partner and their partner can give them feedback as their critical friend on their blog every week. And you can come in once in a while to assess that. Also, in the discussion threads, be the first one in and be the last one in and use students' names. 
if you're the first one in and summarize the discussion or what the topic's been about or, or near the beginning, and you get in at the end and summarize things, students will think you're in all the time and you're not. I was in at a conference in Sweden, in Gutenberg, Sweden, and, and they said, Dr. Bonk, you're in, but you're never there. So what do you mean? She said, we counted how many times you're in, but it seems like you're always there because you strategically post. Post to the controversial things. Post to the things that are really heated debates. Make sure your name's in those. And they'll think, oh, wow, he's in all the time. So be careful about assessment. Don't get sucked in. Tell students you'll be giving feedback on Monday nights and Saturday mornings. And don't expect me all week because the sun never sets on the online class. You cannot be there all the time to babysit. You have to be there as a co-learner and a leader both. And to be a co-learner and a leader, you have to be strategic about how you participate. Now, sometimes you get excited and sometimes you get behind. It's not, you're not gonna be in at the same time every week, but expect me to be in around these times uh, and so forth. There's much more to be said about assessment. Have rubrics for assessing products. Rubrics go a long ways, check, checking off what, what's high quality and low quality, and, and it saves me a lot of time in there. And then have things, some people ask the same questions over and over and over. Have that patented answer for those common questions and then make an announcement. Use announcements as ways to give feedback or email or whatever. Hi from South Africa, good to have you here. What other questions do they have? Hi Sri Lanka, I just wrote the forward to your book. Sharonika uh, has a new book on Sri Lankan open education practices. Put the title down there and maybe they can get a copy. Mena, one question from Batman. Would you please share some insights on the beauty of being an online instructor? It's terribly difficult yet you might have some sweet experiences of it to encourage us. Yeah, Bayman, it's good to have your chapter in the la my last Bayman. Tom Reed's help Bayman get a chapter in my MOOCs and open it in the Global South. The way to have beauty is to never give up. The way to have beauty is to save things and then use them once in a while. Go back to what you saved as ideas. What were ideas become implementable. Have a bunch of things that you've saved that oh, possibilities. The possibilities, when you, when you actually implement a possibility, you smile. When you actually implement a possibility that works, you smell even more. And then when you actually use it and share that possibility with others, even more. And we actually share it and advocate and it gets out there virally. So to, to, you're doing that, Damon. I notice you're sharing what you're doing with me. So save and then try it and then share it and maybe do research on it um, is one way. Find something unique that you can put your stamp on, something that excites you about the, your discipline that you can create a pedagogical activity for, create, create ways to connect the world, bringing in people from other countries to your activity to create social cognition or perspective taking is a way to excite. Bring people into Nepal from America, from Brazil, from India, with you through virtual means is a way that will excite your students and will excite yourself. I could go on and on, but we got lots of questions and, and you know my email, Bay man. So other questions. Uh, Dr. Bong, another very important question raised by a lot of participants are uh, accessibility questions. Uh, what are your suggestions for the areas, rural, remote areas who don't have any Wi-Fi connection? What kind of tips and suggestions do you provide to use these kind of tools in those areas? First of all, buy or ask for free chapters. Write to Susie Granseth. She has a new book on universal design for learning and, and addressing that. In terms of access, um, first of all, what happened in the early days of open ed is there are mirror sites in other countries, in particular in Africa, where there was a very expensive to access open educational resources over, over the Atlantic Ocean. 
So they downloaded them and created mirror sites in Africa and other places so that they didn't have any expenses thereof. And in China, uh, there were the two book, uh, twin books project and other things going on there in, in China, a 1KG project. The 1KG project in Western remote China was bringing in one kilogram of stuff to kids in Western China. Um, and when they were coming to Western China to bring also open educational resources on a CD or on a flash memory stick um, to, to provide the resources, to provide information on what people have. When there's teacher training in Africa, it's done on a mobile today. They leapfrog over computers, over laptops and so forth. So my friend, John Traxler, he does training of teachers in Africa. Uh, and, and actually in Zambia, they're using my Tech Variety book to train teachers because they're using a free app resource. So I would say the best idea is to go back to localization, to form a committee of a group that finds locally relevant and accessible content, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 25 shareable nuggets, and start with that. Start small and get people excited about the small things that are out there that are being used. Bayman has kids, uh, high school, middle school kids learning English through MOOCs. He's gotten people excited by getting certificates in English before they go to college. And, and so, See, see what will work for your local community, what, what, what the needs are, and then access within those uh, parameters, within the parameters that you set up for the populations that you have. Um, this again, all, these are the assessment, accessibility. Uh, these, these are huge qu questions um, that are entire courses, I think, uh, and I could go on for that. Um, so, Yes. Give us One another. last question. Uh, yeah. So, how can we make wide selection from these technology to specific learners? How do we know the tech we select is most suitable to a specific group of students? How do we know the technology work with a specific group of students? Ask them. So, what my colleague Vanessa Denon says the first day of her class, she has a list of technologies. And she says, which ones do you use? Are you comfortable with? And, and, and add to the list. So having a both end, not totally ground up, but go from a base of what students are familiar with, what they're comfortable with, find out. Those polling questions I used could have been related to that. Um, <clears throat> could be related to the student needs. Read the question again, uh, Mena. So it's more, it's more related to how can we decide which technology is appropriate for a specific group of students. Yeah, and sometimes the first time you teach a course, you, you don't really know. And you're not really that expert. And you come in and you be honest with your students. It's the second and third time you teach online. The first time's hard. My department chair who became dean, assistant, associate dean, he had seven students online the first semester and he almost died. Then he said, Kurt, you can teach this class, no problem. 1997, he taught in 1996, introductory educational psychology. It had 20, I said, I'll die. And I almost died. Then the next semester, the next semester I had 30 and it was easy. The first time you teach this way, if you have one student, two students, 100, two, 300, it's hard. Just realize that that you should be relying on tapping into other people, ask questions of colleagues. So Mena and I have done research on professional development of instructors and how people are trained to teach online. They ask other people, they browse websites of existing content. They might read books and might use open ed. It's a combination of things, um, but they're not getting a lot of training. Uh, most, most of the learning comes from browsing other people's websites and saying, oh, I could do that. Well, I could, maybe I could try that. So browse, browse is a huge part of the introduction to um, teaching online and deciding what it is that you want to do. There used to be a website back in 1996 called the World Lecture Hall. It had syllabi from around the world. You know, well today, every, everyone's got syllabi online. Just browse some of those syllabi and, and start there and, and talk to your colleagues who have been trying things out.
and start a little communication back and forth with them uh, and, and go from there. Oh, chapter 14 in the Tech Variety book that I threw out. Um, read chapter 14. It has 10 ideas for helping you start out and, and, and go from there. Try one or two of the 10 ideas in, in chapter 14. It got deleted from um, this book. The publisher deleted four or five chapters. It ended up being the most popular. We put it up online. Publishers are stupid nowadays. I mean, just simply, they are stupid. They change titles, they delete chapters, they do all stupid stuff. So I stopped using them and I, I, that's why the free book is out there. <laughs> I love publishers. Um, may the force be with all of you. Sir, Sarah, do you have a question for me? Okay, we have one left in the queue, then I think we are uh, wrapped up. Um, yeah. The question uh, goes back to, uh, I know you touched base on accessibility in terms of real remote, nice. but we have a question on accessibility, such as uh, hearing impaired students who need yeah. captions, vision impaired students um, who need audio descriptions of animations, um, students with traumatic brain injuries. Uh, how do we accommodate for those with the, some of the tools that you've mentioned? I heard that Zoom is going to create um, screen, uh, some kind of uh, automatic translation in their tool. That's coming. A lot of the tools that are, we see out there, um, I think it was Dot Sub in the early days did that, um, made things accessible, had, had things in another and, and many other languages. I am not an expert at it, although in 2000 I did research on websites. I see the, the thing has gone now on uh, and on visually impaired, dyslexic, and um, hearing impaired students. And it, it was amazing to watch them turn up the words per minute because there's a lot of junk out there. It would say gift tab, gift tab, gift tab, before it would ever give them anything that was recognizable as intellectual input. I really felt sorry for um, the visually impaired folks who were having to put up with that. Um, but the, the JAWS screen reader was an early technology that was out there. There are other tools as well. I would say the number one answer is to not, and the number one critique of the Tech Variety book that I have is we didn't write the book for accessibility purposes. We didn't uh, talk about that. We don't have another chapter on that. Uh, and so the answer I would have is talk to your instructional consulting office or people or anyone in your local region because they'll have better answers than I will have. I am not a special education expert. But again, go to, you can write to me. I'll give you Susie Grosnett's email. She's a special educator um, as well as an instructional technology person. She will have some answers for you or she can send you maybe a chapter of her book or other people's. Um, University of Michigan's changed the way eBooks. Okay, thanks, Cecilia. Um, thank you all for all the questions that you've had. It's 1150. We've had you know, 20 minutes or so of Q&A after a, our a little extended um, talk. Um, thank you all for coming here. And, um, you know, feel free to write me an email. And if I come in here again for Contact North, it will be advertised. I'm sure Sarah will send out a notice. We may have a panel on the new book, the MOOCs book in August. We may have two panels with Sharonica possibly on here on MOOCs and Open Ed in the Global South. Um, I'm at, I put a proposal in, and it's a good chance we'll at least have one panel, maybe two. Uh, Bayman, we'll get you on here too. Uh, so that would be a lot of fun to see you all back here on a, talking about what, what, what's happening in, in your world locally. So, thank well, this you, was Mary. great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Bonk. And again, thank you, Merve and Mayna for, for helping out with, with the Q&A. This has thank been a you. great session. <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, it will, I will post the slides and the recording on www.teachonline.ca under our webinars tab um, probably in the next hour or so. It takes a bit for the recording to um, 
to come up and uh, I might do uh, an edited version and the regular version. So I'll work on that and then I'll have that posted shortly. So thank you again, everybody for joining us. And uh, thank you, Dr. Bach. This was a great session. Yeah, thank you. Thoroughly Long. enjoyed Those, it. Thank you. Those of you who are my former students, you'll notice the hair is longer, <laughs> hence the hat. Um, <laughs> there's, there's no way I'm going to get my hair cut anywhere. So um, we'll see. It's going to keep going like Dr. Brush was in my, my department. I'll have long hair in another month or two. I'll be a hippie. Um, you can get a badge. Of course, everyone gets a bunk badge. <laughs> a bunk Bangladeshi badge. How's that? Uh, thank you coming from Bangladesh and from Cape Town and from Sri Lanka and other parts. Sunne, good to have my advisee with us. Um, coming from S San Francisco area. Tiffany, good to have you here from Georgia. Congrats on your recent journal article. And more, much more. There's always more. Again, there's always more. I'm on sabbatical now, so book three? No, I'm not going to write a third one. Doris from Hong Kong, great to see you. Good to have you with us. So I'm glad Hong Kong, Nepal, we have people around the world. Hopefully I didn't mess up too much today. Hopefully you all jump. Hey, can you put in the chat window if you actually jumped as a final thing, final question. Put in the chat window, say yes or no, you jump. Yes, yes. Okay, Cecilia jumped, Lori jumped. Shufang jumped, okay, Shufang, Sharonika. Oh, right, Tiffany, yes, half jump, half jump, okay. <laughs> okay, John, Elliot, uh, Elliot, did you, gimpy knees and all, huh? Elliot, okay. Uh, <laughs> how's me, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure many of us have gimpy knees, but uh, 101 days of writing in a row and they're still working. How many more days before they give out? I don't know. But Elliot, can I get you running with me one of these days? I need someone to go with me. Uh, we still have 100 people here, believe it or not. <laughs> I want to thank Merve. I want to thank um, Mena. Uh, they're wonderful, not only as students, but as colleagues. We've just published a paper on design in contemporary ed tech, if you want that on training public health students to be designers of curriculum and using design principles. Uh, and Maine has just published a couple more pieces and Merve and I have published coming out Twitter job feeds in the field. She, she, we've analyzed that. We're now looking at LinkedIn. So some cool stuff. Purposeful research as Tom Reeves would say. We have a reason for it. I'm really interested in what the job market is like today. So I guess it's uh, one minute before I'm going to have to depart for another phone call. Uh, so again, it's been great seeing everyone. And Merve and Mena, you're wonderful. And Sarah, thanks for all the help on this. And we'll, we'll talk after the show. Um, I'm going to depart here. Bye-bye. Everyone wave. <laughs> so it's good to have you guys here. Thanks for thanks for everything. I think it went well. So bye Chihan. Bye Sunil. Jeroporn. Bye bye. Okay. Aaron. I think that was Aaron just saw, but we'll see. Okay, I'm gonna go too. Bye bye.